Hi, my name is Sarah Hillegas. Uh, I'm the Creative Writing Postback Fellow here at Barnard. Um, you've maybe received like one or 400 emails from me, depending on how involved with the Creative Writing Program you are. Um, now, I just want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. Um, I know it's finals for a lot of you, um, and you might otherwise be writing papers. So thank you for your support of these amazing, amazing authors, or your procrastination, whichever it was that like brought you here. Uh, we appreciate all of it. Um, I wanted to say thank you to Barnard Events Management, IMATS, and AV for all of their help putting this together. Um, from the English department, thank you to Sarah Pasadino and Julissa Acosta for all of their support, um, as well as professors Peter Platt and Ken Chen, um, who lead our department and our program. Um, and lastly, thank you so much to Word Up Community Books um, Store. They are selling books in the back, so do support them either now or anytime while you're here. They're a really phenomenal bookstore, um, just a little bit north of us. Uh, one quick plug for the program, um, we are hosting a student reading next Thursday, um, same time in Sulzberger Parlor, so on the third floor of Barnard Hall, um, featuring creative writing students uh, taught by these phenomenal instructors, as well as uh, the rest of our really excellent faculty. So do come and support the students as well. Um, I was a creative writing student here a couple years ago. I wasn't lucky enough to have these uh, really phenomenal professors um, teach me, which is probably a good thing because I think I would have been way too starstruck to write about anything. <laughs> um, but. Uh, I do want to say that these writers are each biting in their indictment of the world we live in, um, the people we encounter, the people we are. <laughs> um, their, writing their writing and work reflects the meticulous observations of others, of the self. Uh, they skillfully cut open the characters for us, for the readers to look over, to examine, to judge, and to love. And I'm so, so appreciative and um, really in awe of all of their work. So. I'm delighted to be here tonight uh, to hear um, each of you read from your most recent works. Um, so let's give it up for Elif Batuman, uh, Waiki Wang, and uh, Liana Fink. Hi, I will be introducing our first author tonight. Um, I'm Amy, I'm a senior, and I really, really did not like writing prose until very recently. Um, Professor Batuman's class, Personal um, Narrative and Fiction, has been the highlight of my semester. Um, I still remember the first day of class, some of my classmates are in the audience and they remember it too. We're all sitting there 10 minutes early, no one's making eye contact, we're all like waiting for the footsteps down the hall, like Sarah mentioned, we're all pretty starstruck. I can tell that everyone else read her first novel, The Idiot, and like resonated deeply with the protagonist, Selen, and was probably like turning over their favorite quotes that moment in their mind. Um, and the door swings open and she comes in and she's like, I wanna talk about your guys' writing samples. I'm really honored to be here with you all in this room. And then we start looking at each other because we're just like shocked. Um, she's excited to be here with us. Um, and I think that kind of set the tone for the whole semester where you just feel really seen and respected by someone who you admire so much. And um, obviously she brings a lot of like literary like acumen and all of that deep knowledge and stuff that kind of goes over my head. And she also brings like so much emotional generosity and sensitivity and she really gets into these stories and these worlds that we construct um, in a way that's made it very easy to workshop each other's work and to open up to each other. Um, that's been amazing. But like I said, I read The Idiot the summer before I came to Barnard and I resolved to like fact check some of Selin's conclusions <laughs> using my freshman year the same way she sort of like lives by her own gospel of like older works. Um, and I was curious then to see how the sequel that follows her sophomore year, either or, um, would, would sit with me because I'm a senior looking back on that time now instead of using her as a guide. And I actually read Either Or over Thanksgiving in the Boston suburbs visiting my cousins. And it was really convenient to be surrounded by all the red brick and like every other street was called like Washington or Revere or something. Um, it was easier to step into her world and think, you know, what is it like to come back, get back in the ring um, of campus after like an insane summer studying abroad. Um, I. I was like looking at the passersby on the street, thinking like, oh, how would Selin's like witty and 
irreverent um, student publication, like travel guide, write about them. And I was talking to my Wellesley friends and wondering, uh, like, how do people our age just seem to like cross paths and pair off, like, with no physical or mental agony? Um, it's she's just like a really fun character to to think about, like a friend. Um, which brings me to oftentimes as a writer, you wonder what your work achieves or like who it's for, why it matters. Um, and I know Professor Batuman worries about these things too because we talk about them in class, but as someone who has been clearly so intimately influenced by her work, it's like hard to imagine. Um, but yeah, I'll take a stab at what the novels do for me other than being just like fun to read um, and humorous and you, you feel like you're getting dragged along in this unshakable momentum that Selen has somehow while also being profoundly shaken by everything. <laughs> um, yeah, so she, like I said, spends a lot of time trying to wring meaning out of her favorite novels, like thinking about where the characters go wrong and whether she can avoid the same pitfalls and why women's stories are only palatable when they're told by a man and served with a side of moral commentary. Um, so unlike her favorite authors, Selen spends a lot of time like asking rather than answering questions, and these questions sometimes get really broad and universal, like what's the point of language? What's the point of travel? Is love real? Is love achievable? And then other times they get really granular, like, oh, now I see why my mom always said that very specific thing. Um, and whichever direction she takes you, you like, you're compelled to close the book on your finger to hold your place and like stare into the middle distance and try to apply her realizations to your life. And it's really reassuring. It's really cathartic. It's the same feeling as walking into class that first day and feeling really seen and heard for where you are um, and being told that, yeah, college is a strange and awe-inspiring place full of strange and awe-inspiring people. And sometimes it feels like too much and sometimes you look back and it was all a grain of sand and all of those things are true at the same time and it's so reassuring. Um, so, so being told that outside of knowing it's gonna be okay, we really don't know anything at all, um, has been like amazing and remarkable and I'm just, yeah, very grateful to have had this experience with amazing classmates and an amazing professor. And without further ado, here's Ella. I'm like tearing up. That was such an incredible introduction. Thank you. I do feel so honored and lucky and privileged to be here and to hang out with the incredible, incredible students. And thank you to everyone who's here now. And thank you to Sarah. Um, I'm gonna read from either or. Okay, uh, I'm going to start from um, really near the beginning. Um, I'm going to read a tiny bit from the beginning and then a tiny bit where she like complains about how horrible creative writing classes are. I thought I'd read from that part for, for you tonight. Um, okay, uh, so this is like it's a, it's a campus novel and she just got to campus so you didn't miss anything. This is page five. Um, I actually need reading glasses, which I don't have, All right. Svetlana got to campus, wait, what time is it? <laughs> All right. Okay. Svetlana got to campus the day after me, though it felt like years. I had already slept the night in my new room, eaten breakfast and lunch in the cafeteria, and made numerous trips back and forth to the storage facility, having the same conversation over and over. How was your summer? How was your summer? How was Hungary? I was dissatisfied by the vagueness of my own answers. I still hadn't figured out the right angle. How was Hungary? Lakshmi asked at lunch with a conspiratorial sparkle. Did anything happen? Notwithstanding my strong feeling that a lot of things had happened, I answered the question truthfully in the sense that I knew Lakshmi intended it. Nothing had happened. Svetlana asked me the same question that evening when we met at her suite in New Quincy and sat on beanbag chairs under an Edward Hopper poster and talked about everything that had happened since the last time we had spoken, when I had been in a phone booth in the Hungarian village and Svetlana had been at her grandmother's house in Belgrade. I told her how I finally called Ivan in Budapest, how he showed up with a canoe and we sat up all night at his parents' house. Did anything happen? She asked in a lazier, more amused voice than Lakshmi's, but meaning the same thing. 
Well, like that one thing didn't happen, I said. Oh, Celine, Svetlana said. When Ivan first told me about the summer program in Hungary, he said I should take my time to think about it because he didn't want to force me into anything. Svetlana said that if I agreed to go, Ivan was going to try to have sex with me. This was a possibility I had never previously considered. I daydreamed about Ivan all the time, imagining different conversations we might have, how he might look at me, touch my hair, kiss me, but I never thought about having sex. What I knew about having sex did not correspond to anything I wanted or had felt. I had tried on multiple occasions to put in a tampon. Tampons were spoken of by older or more sophisticated girls as being somehow more liberated and feminist than maxi pads. I just put one in and forget about it. I felt troubled by the implication that a person was constantly thinking about their maxi pad. <laughs> Nonetheless, every few months, I would give tampons another shot. It was always the same. No matter what direction I pushed the applicator, however methodically I tried all the different angles, the result was a blinding electric pain. I read and reread the instructions. Clearly, I was doing something wrong, but what? It was worrisome, especially since I was pretty sure that a guy, that Ivan, would be bigger than a tampon. But at that point, my brain stopped being able to entertain it. It became unthinkable. Svetlana said I had better think about it. You wouldn't want to end up in that situation and not have thought about it, she said reasonably. And yet, it turned out there wasn't much to think about. It was immediately obvious that if Ivan tried to have sex with me, I would let him. Maybe he would be able to... <laughs> I can't read this line without laughing. <laughs> oh, God, I wouldn't be that age again for a million dollars. You guys are killing it, by the way, just all the students. Um, maybe he would be able to tell me what I had been doing wrong, <laughs> and it wouldn't be as terrible as trying to put in a tampon. Um, so then I'm going <laughs> to I'm gonna spoil the book because she, uh, she has sex and it's as amazing as you, you expect from that passage. Um, and then after that, she goes to, how am I doing for time? Oh, I have a lot of time. Maybe I should read, ugh. Um, all right, I'm going to read two tiny parts of the creative writing class. Uh, this is, this is, she has not had sex yet at this part. <laughs> Every week in creative writing, we read two short stories, one by an actual writer and another by one of us. <laughs> the published stories were usually okay, but everything we wrote was awful. <laughs> Why did we have to talk about it? All the suggestions felt random and performative. It was like we were all looking at a malformed sweater and saying, Maybe it would be better if it was a different color, <laughs> or if it was actually made out of ice. <laughs> the most interesting part of class was when the teacher, Leonard, talked about what it was like to be a writer. I had never met a professional writer before, apart from my parents' endocrinologist friend who wrote spy novels under a pseudonym. <laughs> Leonard said that being a writer meant that you lived your life on the outside, looking in. Whenever Leonard went to people's houses, the men would be in the living room talking about football or the stock market. Leonard couldn't survive five minutes in there. He always ended up in the kitchen with the women. They were the ones talking about stuff he actually cared about, gossip, basically, about real or fictional people. Women were kind, so they never kicked him out, though he had no kitchen skills beyond chopping things and opening jars. I, like all the girls and most of the boys in the class, smiled at this description at how the women tolerated Leonard, despite his incompetence. But my smile felt a little mechanical. Why were the women always in the kitchen? And what was it that Leonard had forfeited by being with them? Why was he a writer and they weren't <laughs> when they cared about the same things? Why wasn't he better at cooking? 
why was there something exciting about the brutishness of the men who only talked about sports and money? You never know who has what it takes, Leonard said once. You'll be surprised later by who makes it. In Leonard's first year of grad school, one of his classmates had written a perfect short story about two guys in prison who trained fighting spiders. <laughs> there, there had been no doubt in anyone's mind that he, the author of the story about the spiders, would be the one to become a famous writer. Yet, the next three years had gone by without that guy writing anything that good again, and he still hadn't written a book. In a lot of ways, being a writer was more about endurance than about talent. Writers, Leonard said, were not normal people. As a writer, you were never totally present. You were always thinking of how you would put a thing into words. You were constantly putting yourself on the line and constantly being rejected. You betrayed the only people who really loved you. For this reason, the most honest advice anyone ever gave about becoming a writer was that if you were capable of doing absolutely anything else, you should do that thing instead. I didn't get it. Wasn't everyone capable of doing something else? How is that the test of whether you should be a writer? From the way he talked, it was clear that Leonard considered himself to be a failure, yet he had published two novels that could be found in bookstores, and he was teaching at Harvard. Why did he act as if those things didn't count? A cool dude called Marlin, who had sideburns, wrote a story about a cool dude called Marvin, who sat on different sofas and at some point drank some beer. <laughs> Leonard said kindly, I think what we need to know about this story is whether, and I don't say this at all in a spirit of dismissiveness, but whether it's a story about not being able to get laid. <laughs> because if it is, that's fine, but we need to know that that's what it is. Was that what my story was about? <laughs> um. Leonard assigned us to read My First Goose by Isaac Babel. All the surface markers, the type, the layout, the tone with which Leonard had mentioned it, indicated that it was a great and important story. The narrator, an intellectual, had been sent to join a Cossack military regiment. A Cossack soldier with long blonde hair and a wonderful face defaced the narrator's suitcase and started farting at him. Other Cossack soldiers also made fart jokes. The narrator tried to read a copy of the newspaper Pravda, but was too distracted by the farting Cossacks, so he ordered the landlady to bring him, the landlady to bring him something to eat. The landlady, whose farm had been requisitioned, looked at the narrator with the dripping, half-blind eyes and said that she wanted to hang herself. The narrator responded by seizing and murdering a goose and ordering her to roast it. After that, the Cossacks called the narrator brother, and they all fell asleep together in a hayloft. There were many things I could relate to in this story. I had spent a lot of my formative years trying to concentrate on what I was reading while surrounded by blonde boys with amazing faces who were farting at me but I did not see why the narrator had to murder a goose or be rude to a disabled person. Was it because I knew that no matter how rude I was and no matter how many geese I murdered, the respect and camaraderie of the tow-headed farters would always be turned against me? That I, my name, my appearance, my being was part of what sustained that camaraderie? I knew that by having these negative feelings, I was being simple and simplistic that the story was being more complex and thus more human than I was. The closing lines were about the narrator having nightmares that night, proof that the story wasn't endorsing his actions any more than it was judging them. Great literature didn't judge. It described complex individuals who were neither good nor bad. Oh, I knew how to get an A in English just as well as the next person. <laughs> Um, then there's like a, another little tiny creative writing part. Oh, which maybe I'm not going to be able to find. That's a nice sound. <laughs> um.
In creative writing, we read Chekhov's The Lady with the Little Dog, just to wrap up our tour of Russian literature. Uh, anyway, we read Chekhov's The Lady with the Little Dog. It was about a married man nearing 40 who had an affair at a summer resort with a married woman half his age. So she was my age. She went everywhere with a little dog. After they had had sex for the first time, she cried and said that she had fallen and the evil one had tempted her. Then the man despised her and felt bored. In general, he looked down on women and thought of them as the lower race, even though he always needed to have one of them around and was always having affairs with them and then forgetting about them. At the end of the summer, the man went back to Moscow. At first, he enjoyed wearing a fur coat and going to parties, but time passed and he couldn't stop thinking about the lady with the little dog. That was how he thought about this person, who was 19. <laughs> it's so crazy that she's 19. Uh, anyway, uh, eventually, the man went to the crappy province where the lady lived, tracked her down to the depressing theater where she was attending the opening night, and realized that despite her ordinary, even vulgar clothes and accessories, she was, for him, the most important person in the world. When he cornered her during the intermission, she implored him to go away and told him that she had never been happy and never would be happy, but that she would come to him in Moscow. There was much I did not understand in this story. Did the man like having an affair with the lady? If so, why didn't he think she was special? If she wasn't special, why was he unable to forget her? I also felt confused by the man's attitude toward his children. The part where he was walking his daughter to school, explaining weather formations, all the while thinking of how he wanted to go to a hotel and have sex with his girlfriend, that was something I felt that I had always known. But the part where it said, he was sick of his children, sick of the bank, lumping his children together with his job, that was somehow shocking. In class, everyone talked about how subtle and understated Chekhov was because he didn't idealize the characters and made it clear that the protagonist was a cad. They discussed whether it was a redemption that he was able to feel love for a woman who was banal and wore a gray dress. I wondered whether I was having a defensive response to the story because I hadn't acted the way the lady had when they had sex. I hadn't felt that the evil one had tempted me or that I had fallen, nor was I holding my breath for uh, like the guy, I guess I'll keep his identity secret, to be redeemed by realizing he couldn't live without me. Someone said that the lady with the little dog broke all the rules of storytelling because there was no climax or resolution. Leonard said that maybe that was what was so wonderful about Chekhov, how he was, in a wonderful way, boring. Was that true? Did I agree? Fundamentally, I liked Leonard. It didn't feel like he secretly hated us or was trying to be mean. Yet, almost everything he said caused me pain. <laughs> Céline, any thoughts? Leonard asked. I didn't know how to ask what I wanted to know. Namely, what was wrong with Leonard? And what had been wrong with Chekhov? And why they seemed so unhappy and made us unhappy too? Instead, I talked about my favorite line in the story, the one where the guy realized that all parties were the same. You were always just stuck in a room while drunk people said the same things over and over as if you were sitting in a madhouse or a prison. That's such a great description of what unrequited love feels like, Leonard agreed. I had never heard anyone say the word unrequited and hadn't realized it was pronounced that way or that it was something that Leonard had experienced or not necessarily unrequited, but just not going the way you wanted to. Gazing into the distance, Leonard talked about a wrongness underlying the machinery, and everything he said was true. Thank you. It is my immense pleasure and honor to introduce the next writer this evening. Professor Liana Fink is the author of four graphic novels and a regular contributor of both humor and advice to The New Yorker. Her most recent book, Let There Be Light, is a funny and creative retelling of the book of Genesis, featuring a woman as God. If you're ever given an opportunity to take a writing class with Liana Fink, in which case you should absolutely take it, um, you will receive not only the invaluable advice of a talented artist and writer, but also some sage wisdom. A few of my favorites from this past semester include, don't get that nose job, 
your roommates definitely ate your pizza. Never talk to that man again, and never talk to any man again. <laughs> it's nice to have someone looking out for you. Um, in Let There Be Light, Liana's telling a story. One of us, one many of us know, one many of us know very well, in fact. Um, but she's also telling us, her readers, something more. It can be hard to say what we learned about religion when we consume it in any form, but I learned more about my own relationship with God from this book than I did from many years of religious education. I saw myself in God. I saw my mother and my grandmother and Liana. I saw them in all of the characters. I read most of Let There Be Light in a single long subway ride, subway ride to Brooklyn, and I'm pretty sure I spent the ride recreating the faces that her characters are using to express themselves throughout the novel. Um, I say her characters because in this book, Eve, Noah, Abraham, and Joseph are Liana's characters. It's hard to get my face to look as stunned as Eve's when she bites the apple, or as anguished as Jacob when he wakes up next to Leah. Their emotions are pure and raw, and it's in this way that Liana draws the essence of herself, of her readers, and of God into each character, and what makes the stories we've heard so many times new and alive when told through her images. Liana is thoughtful and hilarious and enormously talented and a million other fantastic things that make her book a one-sitting read. So without further ado, let there be light. Lilia, thank you. That was really wonderful and kind, and I'm really touched. And I'm speaking quietly because it made me shy. Thanks. Can everyone hear me? I will. Um... All right, so this book, I have no idea why I wrote it. It's been about six months, and I knew very well why I was writing it while I was writing it. Um, I, I, maybe for people who, who, like me, grew up with religion and consider themselves part of a religion and don't live in it in their lives so much, like it's kind of something that you're in or out of. And um, I wanted to be in it again and explore it from, from the point of view of myself now who's really not in it and and this book is what came out this is like a very like just a straight reading by me of the book of genesis so i'm gonna be re i hope this is long enough it might not be um reading to you from the story of noah yeah also i'm a graphic novelist um reading from, as is traditional, from the upper left to the upper right to the middle, and then in order that way. When God looked down from her heavenly haunts, she saw the wickedness of man, that everything he thought, um, and he is thinking, I wonder if there is, oh gosh, you know what? This is small. I wonder if there's a kegger I can crash tonight. <laughs> and everything he felt, I'm going to sleep with my neighbor's wife. <laughs> murder, 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 murder. <laughs> See, yeah, don't talk to men. Was, was downright evil. It grieved her. She's thinking, why can't I sleep? Oh, yes, men. <laughs> she knew she would not be able to sleep until she destroyed them. <laughs> There's a certain relief that comes with making a decision. And note that she's, I don't know how easy it is for you to see, but she is hugging a piece of cloud as if it's a teddy bear. So the secret about this god is, it's not really just any female god, it's me. She's immature, she's shy, and she doesn't really know what she looks like. So she draws herself kind of amorphous. Um, so I'll repeat that. There's a certain relief that comes with making a decision, even a horrendous one. There was, however, one man of whom God was very fond. His name was Noah. So she's shy. You know what? She's shy also in Judaism. We don't depict God, and God doesn't show... God's face to us. So I, um, there's always something between God's face and 
man, and in this case, she's holding the moon up so he can't see her. Hi, she, she scoops him up, she says, hi. Um, I am the Lord, your God. And then there's a note that says, a moon is always a good disguise. <laughs> I've made a decision. I am going to destroy the world. And I can't imagine a world without you in it. She told him to build an ark, and she says, make it about yay big. <laughs> when it's finished, I want you to round up two of every kind of animal and bring them inside. And he looks a little nonplussed. <laughs> Just hurry. The floods are coming. And then you see what, have a preview of what the flood is going to look like. It, there's a tear in her eye. This is the story of God's first love. God loved Noah. And then she places him gently down. It's starting. Um, the, the flood is starting. She loved him at a time when she hated everything else, including herself. She didn't want to destroy the world. And then she begins to rumble. She simply couldn't help herself. And she heaves. But by the time the rains came, and the rains pour out of her eyes, Noah, his family, and the animals were all safe on board the ark. Our heroine cried for 40 days and 40 nights. God's love of her creations had eroded imperceptibly over time. There had been the episode with the Tree of Knowledge, and the terrible murder of Abel by Cain. But it wasn't until now that the misery poured out of her in all its brutal force. In other ways, though, she was profoundly happy. The, the way she felt about Noah, it was a new way to feel. As for Noah, and um, I did all this cross-hatching myself, <laughs> who knows if he felt it too? He must have felt something, though, all things considered. And this is a depiction of the growing of a beard. <laughs> Finally, it, whatever it was, stopped. She wasn't crying anymore. She no longer wanted to destroy the world. Then she remembered her friend, which implies that she forgot him, and blew the standing waters away. The ark came to rest on top of a mountain. Noah had been deeply traumatized. <laughs> he wasn't ready to leave the ark. And he says to his friends, one of us needs to go outside and make sure it's safe. Anyone? And then you see the eyes in the dark. Kark, um, says someone. It was the raven. And then it says, nevermore. <laughs> yeah, you get it. <laughs> um, so he puts the raven out. The volunteer flew back and forth above the diminishing waters and finally disappeared. Anyone else? N not the elephants. <laughs> Coo? So when the dove returned bearing an olive branch, no one knew it was time to leave the ark. So the way, um, what you do when you know it's time is you lie in a, a ball and cry. But he didn't. And he's saying, nope, no, nah. -uh. Instead, he waited seven more days, because he's a procrastinator, and sent her out again. And this time, she didn't come back. Misery is a sickness. The sickness is contagious. You catch it from the person you love. Noah caught it from God. So he's still sitting in a ball. Um, and that I'll just read this to torture you. 
Um, and here's what he's saying. Everything is okay. Pull yourself together. 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 Um, yeah, thanks for that 20-minute allotment. <laughs> I'm putting it to really good use. Noah did pull himself together, at least outwardly. After everyone was safely off the ark, he built an altar on which he sacrificed one of God's favorites, the unicorn. <laughs> <laughs> and he's sobbing while he does it, of course. Um, and God's like, very grateful. Thank you, Noah, heart emoji. You really shouldn't. And he's just lying there and he's saying, no, 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 no. Oh, Noah, says God, please don't cry. And as you can see, you can be a graphic novelist and be really bad at ink wash. It's fine. <laughs> You only need to use it once per book. <laughs> and she goes, look, Noah, see? And I labeled the, because I only get one color per book, because um, if they're printed in the US, they get, it's a technical issue. They're not printed CNYK, they're printed spot color. So I labeled the rainbow uh, R-O-Y-G-B-I-V. And he is still crying. I sob, weep, sob, sob. And then, oh yeah, and the altar has a skull and crossbones over it because that's so sad. And he looks up and he sees the rainbow and God's behind it. And she says, listen, Noah, I stopped crying and so must you. I will never destroy the world again. She meant it. Yeah, and the big splash page, really impressive art. <laughs> Another one. One of the first things Noah did in his new life was plant a vineyard. Thirstily, he watched it grow. When it was ready, he made wine. He's stomping on it. Then he drinks glug, glug, glug. Finally, there would be relief. A quick refresher in case you forgot. Noah had a wife and three sons, the most obnoxious of whom was named Ham. Um, and so Ham comes across his father listening to Abba in his dwelling, the dancing queen. Um, and Ham is laughing at his dad. And he goes and tells his brothers, you guys have got to see what dad's doing. Um, he's dead drunk, dancing. Um, now it's Mamma Mia. Um, and then the other brothers are more responsible and kind, and they say, Ham, Dad has been through a lot. <laughs> Careful to avert their eyes, Noah's other sons each took a corner of his garment, and the garment is his kiss the chef apron. Um, and walking backwards, draped it over him. Then they put him to bed. So like every good children's book, this is how this chapter ends. But sleep, and then they went to sleep. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years, and he's saying, boy, am I old, until, until the age of 950. How much longer can this go on? At which point he died, finally. God still thinks of him now and then. What is it that made her choose him of all people? To this day, she can't be sure. <laughs> and that's the end of the chapter. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ellie, but that's not important. Um, it is my honor to be introducing Waika Wang. So my favorite interaction with Waiki is when she said that I should be a lawyer instead of a writer, presumably for the money and not because I'm hopeless. I hope. Um, mm. I told her that I wasn't built for that life, but I didn't have the language at the time to give a proper response. 
After reading Joan is okay, I think I have my answer now. I don't want to be a lawyer because I want to write like Waika. Waika has that expert ability to set up a crushing emotional payoff, the masterful craftsmanship that goes into timing your words just right to bring the reader to their knees. She knows what it means to sacrifice a part of yourself for your work, to lose yourself so completely that the reader has no choice but to feel what you feel. Waika makes her characters, her emotions universal, and it is an honor to be in her class and learn all of this from her. Waika, you know how much I struggle with trying to put my feelings about any work into words. It feels like pulling teeth. So I hope you know that in doing so for Joan is okay, I am composing a love letter to your writing. Joan's precision, her piercing insight, are so hard for me to distinguish from Waika herself because Joan is just so compellingly written. Also because I see those aspects in Waika. I've taken many a creative writing workshop and none have struck me as a revelation as much as Waika's. Her love of critical analysis and her knowledge of everything that could possibly make a reader tick is constantly, intimidatingly, on show. Her true mastery of technique is her ECMO, and if you read the book, you'll know what that is. Once, Waika said to us that the best endings are the ones that keep the reader imagining. Now, every time I walk by Mount Sinai or St. John the Divine, I see Joan in her scrubs walking home, tired from work. But most of all, I see Joan at Tsingmingzi. I practice how to pronounce that, by the way. Um, <laughs> kneeling down at her father's tomb, sweeping away the dust. Waika, you have gone above and beyond every single literary rule you have imparted to us. Your work in the classroom and on the page will keep all of us imagining. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. That was so, so great. You, you should be a writer, not a lawyer. I didn't, I didn't say this. <laughs> um, so uh, I, you know, you guys should all read Joan. I didn't know we were gonna read from the book, so I'm gonna read something new, if that's okay. Um, but the first book, my first book was called Chemistry, and the second one is called Joan is Okay. Um, and uh, I've been working on a third book. Um, I got to the end, the book, I'm currently in the stage where the last 60 pages is pretty bad, but the beginning is, I think, okay. So we're gonna, we're gonna see how it goes. Um, this story, or this, this book, is, gonna, is called Summer House, and I'm starting from the beginning. She had started looking in winter by browsing rental sites recommended by friends who went away for long periods of summer and knew about this stuff. They knew, for instance, which towns along the Cape had the cleanest beaches, which towns on Nantucket were the most kid-friendly, and which ice cream stands the Obamas frequented on Martha's Vineyard. As these guru friends gave their tips, Carew took notes on a notepad. She wrote down, Martha's Vineyard equals Obama's equals ice cream. She marked kid-friendly places as ones to avoid. For the past five years or the entirety of their marriage, she had told Nate that this was the summer they would take time off, leave Manhattan, and spend a month in a classic New England cabin with gables, shutters, walking distance to the Atlantic Ocean, two beds, and a driveway. Two beds so that both sets of parents could visit staggered, a driveway so that everyone could come by car and park without incurring street fines. While Carew still wished and planned for her parents and in-laws to visit, why Carew still wished and planned for her parents and in-laws to visit was purely aspirational. While Nate had come to terms with the fact that he'd come from a family who no longer understood them, Carew had not. In the lead-up weeks, Nate spoke of not being too idealistic. When a cabin in Chatham was finally booked, he was shocked and thought he hid his shock well until his wife asked why he always looked so shocked. Soon, they were in a rental hybrid car driving north for six hours with a trunk full of food, clothes, cleaning supplies, and their gigantic three-year-old sheepdog, Manto, panting in the back seat. As idealistic as Carew was about summer, Raising a full-sized sheepdog in the city had been Nate's idea. But he told people that Manto was 70% fluff, so highly compressible, so like a 20-pound dog wearing a fur coat. Nate had grown up with a mother who had allowed two cats, many fish, a snake, but no dogs. Those purebreds are expensive and bougie, she'd said. Why waste money on them when there are so many strays to take in? None his mother ever took in. About the name of their sheepdog, Carew and Nate had quarreled. Manto means steamed bun, said Carew, who was bilingual, had been born in China, and spoke only Chinese with her parents. I know what it means, said Nate, who'd been taking Chinese lessons ever since he realized 
that whenever he was with Karu and her family, he had no idea what was going on. So what's wrong with Mento? asked Karu. Nate brought up the propensity of yuppie couples to name their expensive dog after basic starch items. The dog had come from a reputable breeder. They'd been two years on a wait list and paid a non-substantial, non-insubstantial deposit to be on that wait list. Karu said there was no fruit or vegetable she enjoyed enough to dedicate their dog to. She would also not be giving their dog a human name like Stacy. <laughs> this was a proper noun they had to be okay saying dozens of times a day, especially in exasperation, while searching for the dog in random parts of the park. Karu suggested another name, Quadra, or a fancy-shaped swirly steamed bun, but Nate couldn't make the R sound needed, couldn't roll her ton his tongue right and suspend it in the middle of his mouth, so agreed that Mento was probably fine. The first week at the cabin was just that, besides walking Manto twice a day around the small fenced neighborhood of other rental cabins, Kura and Nate stayed in and binged real estate shows that featured million dollar properties. They talked about how crazy it would be to ever buy in their city, a city they both love, but a city not without its problems like cost, housing, hard to follow weekend transit apps updates, and a large rich population who never took public transit and went on about how great and affordable the city was. Once Nate and Karu came out of that slump, they cooked easy meals with Hamburger Helper and drank copious amounts of gin. When Mento brought them a toy, they tossed it for her or played tug until she tired herself out. They had sex at random times of the day at various positions, sometimes with Karu's travel vibrator that she would wrap in a sock and bury deep into their suitcase once parents were present. There was no street noise in Chatham, no constant annoyance of being surrounded by human congestion. The silence became a frequent topic of discussion. Should a lack of sirens be in it of itself alarming? Was everyone dead or alive and well? And how do residents vent personal frustrations if they can't lay on the horn or scream at each other? Another topic of conversation was whose parents were more difficult. Each side made a strong case for their own, but this was pure anxiety talking and the answer didn't really matter. The order of the visits was strategic. Carew's parents cared about cleanliness and personal safety to an obsessive compulsive degree. And since the start of the pandemic had yet to go outside without double masks, gloves, and mace. If they ate out twice a year before at the behest of Carew who thought an American family should, they never would again. They would never order takeout again. And unless it was to see dying relatives or their own parents' grave, should China's borders ever reopen, they would never again board a plane. Karu's parents lived in central Minnesota, where Karu went to high school but did not consider home. To avoid spending a night in a motel, her parents drove to Chatham in shifts, stopping only at state-run rest stops, eating ramen noodles cooked in the car. They were visiting first, else they wouldn't have agreed. They would have refused to stay in a cabin in a bed that some other couple, even if it were Nate's parents, had slept in before. On their last night alone, Nate walked down to the street to the local wine shop and brought a bottle of red for dinner. He wanted to give Karu the option of getting completely hammered because once her parents arrived, she would not want to drink in front of them lest risk their calling her an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. When he returned from the store, the whole place smelled as expected like bleach. Karu was in the bathroom scrubbing the grout and picking black specks off the ground. Then she was in the kitchen wiping water stains off the appliances the dishes and utensils that were already clean from the night before. She loaded into the dishwasher again and blasted them on high heat. Don't tell my dad we used the dishwasher, she said. Nate said he knew he'd made that mistake before in the first year of their marriage, letting it slip to his father-in-law that he and Karu used the dishwasher nightly, or sometimes just for fun, thinking, <laughs> thinking it would become an inside joke between men. You're welcome to use that machine, Nate, his father-in-law had said formally as if they were in court, but Karu should not. To use a dishwasher is to admit that one is not industrious enough and has fallen prey to first world conveniences. No one is so busy that they can't take 10 minutes out of their day to clean up their own mess. While you may not be comfortable using a sponge and detergent, Karu is, and you must encourage her to continue doing so. This comment put Nate in a strange place. On one hand, his father-in-law had openly and casually called him inept. <laughs> On the other, he also seemed to endorse Nate treating Karu like the help. Nate laughed nervously as his father-in-law watched. 
Nate learned that day that he and his father-in-law would not be friends as he was with the fathers of his previous girlfriends. He would not be drinking beer outside with them while grilling steak or fly fishing or losing at cornhole. They would not be attending sporting events together or debating March Madness, and besides the well-being of Carew, they would share no common interests. Nate asked Carew what she wanted to eat for dinner before her parents arrived with coolers of homemade food, and then there would be no choice. Carew said she wasn't hungry. The trash, recycling bins were still full. She needed to launder all the sheets again, all the blankets, wash the windows, mop the floors, sweep the driveway, lint roll herself, and do a last round of checks. While his wife did some of that, Nate ate a granola bar with his hand cupped under his mouth. <laughs> then he uncorked the wine and set it on a napkin on the dining table next to a single paper cup. He took Manto out for her evening walk down the unswept driveway around the gravel path that led into a sand path that led down to a small beach. There were signs everywhere about dogs being on leash at all times, which uh, at all times, which at all times underlined and in bold Font. But since the beach was empty, Nate, lay, Nate, Nate let Mento off for five minutes and watched her run towards the waves. Upon arrival, upon arrival, Carew's parents took a brisk walk around the property. They commented on small imperfections, like the narrowness of the driveway, the lack of a garden hose, should they need, to put, should they need it to put out fire, should the, cat, should the house catch on fire. It wouldn't, Carew said, and her mother said, you can't possibly know that. Lightning could strike, or the neighbors not want us here. Carew said she'd met some of the neighbors. None seemed that interested in arson. Her mother took her index finger and pressed into the center of Carew's forehead. She told Carew, don't be so annoying and listen to your mother. I'm the only one you have. <laughs> Nate's presence was mostly unacknowledged. Her parents waved to him but kept six feet away. He was OK with this arrangement. Mento was outside with them in a corner of the driveway peeing. Then she leapt towards Carew's father, who dodged and said to Manto in Chinese, not before we wash your paws. Once her, once her parents deemed the area hab habitable and free of immediate threats, it was time to unload coolers, enter the cabin, unmask, and unglove. While Carew's mother prepared lunch, Carew's father brought out a basin of lukewarm water to clean each of Manto's paws meticulously between the digits. Then he showed the brown water to Carew and Nate, who had insisted on paw wipes and no basin. Then, Carew was then Mint Manto was allowed inside. After a lunch of cucumber salad, stir-fry noodles, pork skewers, and sautéed cabbage, Carew's mother recruited Carew to wash dishes with her, and Carew's father recruited Nate to talk about fuel cells. <laughs> Carew's, father worked in en Carew's father worked in energy as an industry chemist, and Nate was an academic professor academic professor who studied roundworms. Being both men of science, it would seem that there could have been some overlap, but each time they met, the question his father-in-law opened with was if there was any new research in biology or applied biology that could help with the current energy crisis, our inevitable withdrawal from fossil fuels, and the irreversible environmental damage caused already by billions of combustion engines. Fuel cells are the future his father-in-law would say, lightly pounding his fist on something like his other fist. <laughs> not nuclear or electric cars, not Elon Musk, but fuel cells that can convert hydrogen gas to current with zero emissions. Nate hmmed and mmmed, then said as if he had, as he had the other times, that since he mostly studied worms, he <laughs> knew of no recent advances that could help this future, though he felt badly about it um, and was glad his father-in-law was working on the problem. <laughs> Nate used to think his father-in-law only spoke about fuel cells as a means to self-aggrandize. Then it occurred to Nate a few years back that maybe fuel cells were the only area that Curry's father felt proficient enough to carry on a solo discussion in an English that was reflective of his intellect. Her father had lots of company patents, lots of papers with long calculus and Greek symbols that Nate couldn't understand. With fuel cells, his, her father controlled the narrative and his own self-image. When Nate mentioned this fuel cell fixation to his mother as a funny anecdote, she didn't find it that funny and had asked, what do you mean that's all he talks to you about? He can't talk to you about anything else, not the weather or your own work. Why does he expect you to get to know him but not the other way around? His mother usually called Nate from their landline in their cramped kitchen, hunched over a bar stool, an apron around her waist, but no food on the stove. While Nate and Carew were still dating, she also had questions. 
are her parents citizens? Is Karu a citizen? Do they feel more American or Chinese? Do they speak only Chinese around you? Do they know you don't understand Chinese? Have you asked? How is that offensive? You just explain very politely that we speak only English around Karu and expect Karu to speak only English with us. Other questions, what kind of immigrants are Karu and her parents? What kind of Chinese people? Do the, did they enter the country the white way? Do they believe in God? The questions disappointed Nate and he, he considered saying so, except he also didn't want to hear her excuses for why xenophobia was not xenophobia. Like that she was mother bear and only asked these hard hitting points for his own benefit to help protect him and them from unseen motives like a parasitic foreign wife. The question of citizenship was the one his mother asked the most, and to help her disappoint him less, the only one he chose to answer. He explained the entire process. To become US citizens, Karu and her parents had given up their red Chinese passports when Karu was not yet a teen. They'd taken the tests, gone through the interviews, pledged to the flag, been firmly handshaken, and assured, congrats, you're now in the land of the free, which your former country was not. <laughs> but even if Karu was not a citizen, even if she were still on a green card or a visa and their marriage could speed up the process, it didn't matter to him. He would marry Karu nonetheless. His mother said it didn't matter to her either, as long as Nate was happy. Three months later, she asked about Karu's citizen status again, for she had forgotten what Nate had said, though she promised to write it down, this answer that didn't matter to her. Thank you.